Hi, I'm Jason Mears, and this is a video about hybrid cloud and public cloud for higher education and local government. And the reason I've combined the two is that there are some common features I found between both of them, uh, specifically around uh, a, a want or a need to move to a public cloud based on Microsoft Azure. So as the two were very similar, I thought I might just do a video that covered both use cases, uh, but still went into the specifics of each one. So to begin with, there's an assumption that actually private cloud and public cloud is on everybody's agenda or on everybody's radar. And we've got the options of having a private cloud on one side, usually with two data centers, usually two VMware vSphere data centers, and then an appetite or an interest in moving to something like a public cloud service like Amazon AWS, Google GCP, Google Cloud Platform, or Microsoft Azure. And then also another kind of common theme is that actually, although most people talked about cloud first, uh, what they're actually doing is looking at SaaS first. So universities quite often looking at things like Blackboard and Moodle. Uh, common between the two are things like telephony services moving up into the cloud, but also services like paying a bill or connecting to a government service. So actually, although people say cloud first, quite often they're looking at SaaS first and then um, a kind of a, a, a new interest in uh, using public cloud. So most people start with the assumption that what they want to do is go to public cloud and it's going to be Amazon, Google or Microsoft. So just to show how people do that, extend out to the cloud again, we've got a private cloud and a public cloud. We've got two VMware data centers at one side. And then I'm going to select Microsoft Azure because in this particular video, the higher education and the local government, Azure by far seems to be the most popular of any of the public cloud services. Um, and take that on as like a third uh, place where you can run stuff. So you've got a VMware vSphere private cloud at one end running VMware flavored virtual machines or VMware colored virtual version machines. Um, and then on the Microsoft side, I'm going to use Microsoft flavored or Microsoft colored virtual machines. So I'm just using the color to identify the difference between the different hypervisor and different file format used between all of them. But, but just to say the green stuff is compatible with the green stuff, the blue stuff is compatible with the blue stuff, but there's no obvious way of kind of moving things backwards and forwards without some kind of re-architecture or re-platform or conversion. So just to show that again um, in a slightly different way, the reason lots of people are looking at it is that they have two data centers and one of which either needs uh, a lot of money to bring it back up to spec or needs a renewal or something like that. And what they're actually looking at is considering whether that second data center might be a public cloud provider. So they're talking about moving data center two from on-prem to the cloud and then shutting down that data center. So this is one of the most common things I see because there's a huge cost associated with a new data center refresh. So that's probably the most common case I see and the most common cloud provider is by far Microsoft for the higher education and the local government uh, things that I work on. So again, we've got VMware flavored virtual machines at this side, and we've got Azure flavored virtual machines at this side. The difficulty being is that if you want to migrate some of the stuff you have on-prem to the cloud, because it's a different flavor or a different color, um, you're going to have to do some kind of conversion or migration in order to get them there. So in some cases, it's not quite as simple as most people were led to believe the first time around. Now, as a response to that, or kind of as a counter to that, VMware have a solution called VMware Cloud Foundation. And that's essentially VMware giving our software stack to Amazon and Microsoft and Google to run directly on their hardware and then resell back to customers. So this is a service that you pay Amazon, Microsoft or Google for. And at the back end, they use our software and they pay us for the use of our software. But what it means is you have this consistent platform across the top. So you have this consistent infrastructure for doing things and compatibility across the board. So you're still using a public cloud provider and you're still paying for it in a cloud consumption model, but you have compatibility with all the existing virtual machines, applications, platforms, solutions, tools, and staff that you already own, or you're, you already employ or already own. So that's what a hybrid cloud is. It's extending a private cloud into a public cloud in a way that is compatible or sensible or rational so that you don't have to re redeploy, reconvert, rewrite all of those things or take on multiple extra tools and skills and capabilities to do it. So the advantage of a hybrid cloud is you can move something from on-prem into a public cloud um, or any of the public clouds and equally you can bring them back. So it may be that something is more suitable in one particular place or it might be that one cloud provider offers 
better um, pricing than another cloud provider, or maybe even that all cloud providers become too expensive. You need to bring everything back on side. But that thing at the top, the hybrid cloud, is the bit that gives you that flexibility. So this video is going to focus specifically on that Microsoft Cloud. So this is a Microsoft Cloud platform running VMware software, bare metal. So it's the same VMware hypervisor tools and management interfaces used to before, but it's been uh, delivered by Microsoft as a service, as a cloud service on a cloud consumption model. So that would allow you to run lots of virtual machines on a, in a consistent manner and not actually care about where they're running, whether it's in one of your data centers or somebody else's, because we now have a single platform, not dissimilar data centers and cloud platforms. So just as an example here, if you were to try and do that refactor or replatform, that means taking some of these different flavored virtual machines and trying to turn them into a Microsoft flavored machine. Some people have great difficulty with that. I have customers that have been trying to do this for two years and still uh, didn't manage to do a single application because there were some difficulties in, involved in that. Uh, and some people will struggle and they'll go backwards and forwards. But essentially, lots of customers who, who do try this may get some across, but they're going to have this mixed environment where some stuff is VMware flavored on-prem and some stuff is Azure flavored uh, in the cloud. Now, the issues that come with that are latency, performance, networking, and traffic costs. So latency just refers to the fact that it takes longer to go to the cloud and back than it does to access another server in the same rack or in the same data center. Um, it's one of those things that we've never had to consider before because on-prem is so fast uh, when connecting to something else on-prem that this latency, most people don't even understand what the requirements are for an application or at what level of latency applications break because we've never had to care about it before. Um, the other thing people are noticing is sometimes the latency doesn't break the application, but one particular customer I can think of got an application to work, but it now took two minutes to launch an application that used to start instantly. So although the application didn't break, the performance was unacceptable from the end user's point of view. Um, other considerations are networking. that people have to create brand new networks or dissimilar networks so you can't keep the same IP addresses or VLANs or network constructs as you did before or you have a separate set of tools for managing networks and security. Um, and one of the other ones, a real big killer here is that even if you get it to work, sometimes the traffic costs for moving things backwards and forwards on a daily basis across uh, a cloud provider um, can be more than the cost of hosting the virtual machines or applications and services themselves. So one of the things we're saying here is the cost of moving to a cloud provider obviously needs to be calculated, but it may be the cost of the traffic moving backwards and forwards that has an even bigger impact and you won't know what that cost is until you've done the move. So there are a couple of things. I'm not going to dwell on many of them. I'm going to go to something that um, a VCDX or a VMware certified design expert would do if presented with this problem. So VMware certified design experts use something called ramps. And it basically says if you make an architectural change to part of your environment, you should consider, consider the following things for every change that you make. So how does that change affect recoverability? availability, manageability, performance, and security. So for each thing you change, you should at least consider those things. So it's not as simple as just saying we're cloud first and it's this platform, let's just move everything. There are some real tangible problems that you need to solve and some other things you need to consider as part of that. So that's when you're doing a refactor and a replatform where everything is pretty much changing. Um, I would probably simplify that and talk about best and worst or almost like a risk reward type thing and um, when doing that refactor and replatform the worst possible thing I can think of is that you take the organization out of action for a number of days or a number of weeks and you kind of cause everybody in the organization problems that that's the worst case scenario the best case scenario is that you do all of this and nobody notices it works exactly the same as it did before so on a risk reward point of view there seems to be a lot of risk and not much reward um, aside from maybe that you're using a cloud consumption model with a cloud provider but that's exactly what VMware Cloud Foundation and Hybrid Cloud does uh, give you it gives you the ability to use a public cloud provider and a cloud consumption model without having to rewrite or replatform or redeploy all of the things that you already have 
Um, because as we said before lots of risk and no reward because if it works exactly the same as it did before and nobody notices you could argue that it's been a lot of work for very little reward um, or very little benefit so that's how Cloud Foundation works and essentially on the left hand side of the screen you've got VMware vSphere or VMware Cloud Foundation running on something called the Microsoft Azure VMware solution and that is no more than a VMware environment installed bare metal on a Microsoft Azure cloud platform. And again, the name of that product is Microsoft Azure VMware Solution. And the way that works is that um, on the left hand side, it's on premise infrastructure that's owned and operated by the customer. At the top, all the workloads, so all the virtual machines and applications and services are still owned and operated by the customer. But the infrastructure, on the right hand side, the Microsoft Azure VMware solution is owned and operated by Microsoft. So just to be clear, the customer still is responsible for the VMs and the applications and services and the stuff that's on-prem, but the stuff that's in the cloud is entirely Microsoft owned and operated. So the maintenance of supplying hardware, um, power, cooling, racking, and patches specifically for the hardware and the hypervisor are with Microsoft, but the workloads and applications and services and the application patches are the responsibility of the customer. Um, and you can look at it this way as well, that you've got on-premise and CapEx on the left-hand side and public cloud and OpEx on the right-hand side. So just to explain my, why you might want to do that. If you go for a cloud first strategy and have more than one cloud, you could end up with multiple platforms. So you could end up with four different hypervisors in four different pub, uh, environments, whether that be on-prem or public cloud, four different sets of management tools, four different sets of security policies, four different sets of um, operations. It just becomes a bit of a nightmare. And for some people, a cloud first strategy has resulted in something like this, where you have your on-prem, you have your uh, cloud provider for one thing, another cloud provider for another, another one for another, maybe backups and development in another, and you can end up with a more complex environment than you started with. And apart from it being dif more difficult to manage, the, the thing that I am particularly concerned about, and in that example, is four different firewalls and four different sets of security policies, because I think organizations already struggle with change control and security policies on a platform they understand. Having to do this in four different places at once with four different sets of tools and methods of doing things, I think could be even worse. So in order to avoid all of that duplication, 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 the idea is that you have a cloud management platform, the thing that we're showing on the bottom right under the screen. So you've got a, a, a consistent way of doing compute, storage, network, and security, and modern applications and containers and container management. So here, the compute, storage, network, security, modern apps, containers, and a, a container management system like Kubernetes. We've got health, risk, efficiency, waste, automation and blueprints, traffic and traffic analysis, cost and cost comparison, login, auditing and correlation. Now, if you were to do that on every single platform, there would be four different sets of tools for doing that on every platform. Another consideration would be things like backups and recovery, because if you've got VMware flavor backups and you've got Amazon flavor backups, Google and Microsoft, if your VMware environment is the part that is, you've got a problem with or a disaster at that particular site, where can you restore that backup to if all the other platforms run dissimilar hypervisors and platforms? So actually backups and recovery become a problem because you may find you've got multiple data centers, but you may find that none of them are compatible with each other. And I do even know some customers who have gone from an N plus one environment where they've got resilience to an N plus nothing plus another N plus nothing plus another N plus nothing plus another N plus nothing. And what they've actually done is not uh, not simplify the environment. They've made it far more complicated. Um, other bit is staff and training and skills. So you might have a group of people that understand that particular set of technologies and you might need to retrain, reskill or get new people that understand all of the others. So from a complexity point of view, things just get worse. So you've gone to a cloud consumption model, but actually you've made your environment more complex than it was before. So the bit VMware talk about that is Cloud Foundation, a way of doing consistent infrastructure and consistent operations. So we've always had this ability to do compute storage network security, cloud native apps, containers, Kubernetes, uh, health risk efficiency, waste, automation, blueprints, application traffic analysis, cost and what if modeling and login and color 
uh, correlation. The the impressive thing is not so much that we can do all of those things. The impressive thing is that we can do that across multiple environments. So we really don't care what the hardware is underneath in your own data centers or which cloud provider you're throwing at the bottom there to provide the infrastructure. We, we provide a consistent way of accessing that infrastructure no matter what make, model or cloud provider you are using. And on the top, we can do this consistent compute storage network and security for virtual machines and containers and applications, again, regardless of what make model of hardware or what even what make uh, what type of cloud provider or data center using at the bottom. So it's, you know, Cloud Foundation is essentially giving you consistent infrastructure and consistent operations across multiple data centers and cloud providers in a way that works best for you. So again, that's you know on-premise and capex. It's public cloud and opex. But the idea is that we can help you focus on delivering remote learning and student services, or providing a better experience for staff or local local government and local citizens. But the point is, it takes the infrastructure problems away, so you can focus on the end user or the citizen or the applications and services. So they're all good things uh, but i think this is probably the the key point from my point of view about why you might want to do this so on the left hand side we've got vmware vsphere in two data centers running on cloud foundation we can extend that to azure vmware solution so that's vmware platform on amazon uh, on azure, um, microsoft azure um, and that gives you a hybrid cloud with which you can move VMware flavored virtual machines backwards and forwards. But the real trick that I think people are missing here is that once you've got something in Azure um, public cloud, there's also the Azure native cloud services which you can take advantage of. So things like containers, Kubernetes, functions as a service, AI and machine learning. So once you've got that, you now have an adjacency between your hybrid cloud and your public cloud. And what that means is the traditional applications or legacy applications you already run now have adjacency to a public cloud environment, which means with those older applications, you can now use containers or functions, and you might want to put a modern um, kind of web web browser front end on an old application or you might want to be able to access an old application or the data in it from a mobile device, a, a mobile phone or a tablet. The place where I think this really becomes interesting is when you've got legacy applications or older applications with 10, 15, 20, maybe even 30 years worth of data in them, and they are adjacent to the artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities of a public cloud. Because machine learning is great and artificial intelligence is great, but it, it counts for nothing if you cannot bring a rich source of data to it. And most organizations have a wealth of data in legacy applications, but they are not adjacent to public cloud services. So just by doing that hybrid cloud and using public cloud services, you could move to a model where you can add new capabilities to an old application. So that might be clearing for a university or it may be something to do with the housing system for a local government. Um, and the common threads that are here across both of these, which is why I've put them together in the same video, is that I'm commonly hearing people talking about wanting to be able to use artificial in intelligence and machine learning, sometimes to improve the service, but sometimes because there's pressures on the number of staff and anything that can be automated or done by a machine takes the pressure off the uh, pre you know the, the number of staff that they have. But it's always about sentiment analysis and natural language processing. So understanding uh, either how angry or upset somebody is or understanding what department or what service they're trying to get to um, also things like recommendations and chatbots and assistance so sometimes if you know somebody wants a particular service that they are likely to want the net uh, another service immediately after or the two are related so it might be that if you apply for one benefit you want something else or if you have one service you want something else so even a recommendation engine or a chatbot can help because it takes the pressure off a limited number of employees and a limited number of hours in the day so just a kind of a nod there to the fact that hybrid cloud is generally much easier than public cloud for somebody in a local government or maybe a higher education environment but actually once you get there you get the benefits of a true public cloud things like you know containers uh, functions modern applications that run in a browser or on a 
uh, mobile phone or a tablet but actually it's probably the artificial intelligence and the machine learning that you'll get the most benefit from long term so that was my overview of um, public cloud and hybrid cloud for higher education and local government thank you very much for your time and i hope you found that useful